God's grace, his mercy, and his peace to you, dear brothers and sisters. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. The words we have just sung could not be more powerfully realized than what we realize this day as a congregation. Last week with the death of Ron Reitzma, on November 1st with the death of Vincent Wilson, and of the death of the previous pastor of this congregation, the Reverend Daryl Sternberg. Death is right before our eyes, but the reminder of the Lord to us is death is but a twinkling eye. That's why we're here, you know. We are preparing for our own deaths. Every one of us, no matter how young or how old, we sing the glory of God. Preparing for that time, we close our eyes at the last here on this earth, and we are joined with our heavenly Lord and Savior. What our Lord describes in his sermon, given on the Sermon of the Mount, which we call it in Matthew chapter 5, St. John sees in his apocalypse the vision he is granted by Almighty God to see the coming of of all of those who have died from the ages past to his time to the future. He sees a great multitude of the poor in spirit made rich in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He sees those who were persecuted like the prophets were persecuted. They have come now to their reward. They have left behind all mourning all meekness, all hunger and thirst. Day and night they serve the Lord in his temple, and they are satisfied. St. John is in his apocalypse sees the saints of God purified and gathered about the Lamb who has freed them by the outpouring of his precious blood. And notice this as John reveals this sight before his eyes. He names no movie stars. He names no celebrities. He does not name the apostles. He doesn't name the martyrs or the prophets. He does not name the kings or the reformers or saints commemorated by the church. Oh, they are there for sure. But he does not see them and he does not notice them. All he sees are saints, a great multitude, all loved and honored by God. It is not so much that they are indistinguishable, it's that they are in the glory of God. He does notice, however, that they are from every tribe and every nation. But his attention is firmly fixed not upon them, but upon the Lamb. And this John is just like them, for he sees that all the saints and all the holy angels and the four living creatures are adoring the Lamb, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For salvation belongs to the Lamb, to Jesus Christ, and to him alone. Yet Jesus gives it away. And to whom does he give away this glorious salvation? To you, to me, to us sinners. These saints that John sees around him are saved sinners. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might are his, and they will be his forever. But Jesus bestows upon them, upon sinners, sinners who hated and rebelled against him, sinners who forgot or neglected or abandoned him, Sinners who did not deserve the eternal blessings, but received these blessings by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He has brought them out of the great tribulation. Jesus has purified them with fire. They suffer no more. They suffer no slander, no false accusation. No one steals from them, betrays them, 
or hurts them anymore. They've also been set free from gossip, jealousy, lust, anger, and fear. They have been free, set free from all sin, for Jesus has brought them and bought them out of sin. No one sins against them, and they themselves commit no sins anymore. And the latter is greater, for we sinners are hurt more by our own sins than the sins of others. But these saved sinners and the great multitude are free. Jesus has made their robes as white as snow. They have no sin anymore, and this because of the love of Jesus. Jesus has cleansed their hearts and consciences. Jesus has restored them to their finest essence, to their truest selves. For in removing guilt and regret, shame and fear, Jesus has remade them into his perfect image. Jesus came from heaven and took upon human flesh in order to restore humanity to its original perfection, to return humanity to the way God created humanity to be. And St. John sees, he sees perfectly this vision to the end result, paradise restored. The fall in the garden, that garden of Eden, is now reversed. Human beings reconciled to their creator by the Lamb of God, who is the promised seed of woman, that they might dwell with him in his kingdom forever. Jesus places into their hands palm branches of victory. They have overcome the evil one by the blood of the Lamb. They reap the very benefits, the plunder and the glory of Jesus because of Jesus' sacrifice. They reap where they did not sow. They buy and eat without money or cost. Jesus relieves them of all burdens and bestows his own inheritance and perfect love upon them. And of all their joys, of all their joys, here is the greatest. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, is in their midst, right there before their eyes. Jesus is with them. And that's the definition, after all, of blessed, to be with Jesus. Salvation is his, and so salvation is theirs. His kingdom is theirs. The palms, the branches that are in their hands, and the psalms of praise that come off their lips, they are his and he is theirs forever. They are poor, mourning, hungry, and persecuted no more. But they remain in heaven as they were on earth, blessed. For Jesus is theirs, and Jesus is with them. Now, the only difference between them and you is that they have already passed through the veil of death, and you still abide in it. Your day, however, will come. Your sins will end. Your sorrow will flee. But even now, like them, you are blessed. Jesus, your holy lamb, is in your midst. Jesus is with you. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that is theirs, is within you. It is yours. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the object of angelic protection and prayers. For you were sealed and anointed in the holy waters of baptism with the fullest name of God, not Yahweh, not Jehovah, not Adonai, not the Lord, but the fullest name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as you were washed with water and the Word in his name. You were pulled out of those killing waters to new, everlasting life. You are here today to receive anew the forgiveness of sins, to be absolved, to hear the Word, to pray and praise your God. And to finally, 
join in the most direct communion to eat his body and drink his blood, to have Jesus come inside of you, to penetrate your heart and soul, to join you to himself. The great multitude that St. John saw did not simply consist of those who had already come to heaven while John was exiled on the island of Patmos. If it were, he could expect that St. Mary and his friends and loved ones who had gone before him, and also all the saints of the Old Testament, were there. They were there, of course, but there were more. For St. John saw the culmination of all creation. He witnessed the great multitude after the resurrection on the last day. When he was transported to heaven, he also was transported out of time. So, literally this, just think about it. John saw people who weren't even born yet. People like St. Augustine, Gregory the Great, Martin Luther, and he even saw his own great-grandchildren. This means that he also saw you. That's right, he saw you. What he describes in Revelation 7 is not about them, the saints of God, it's about you. These are your people. You are there. St. John looked and saw the American and German and French and Russian and Greek and Chinese and Vietnamese saints, even nations and tribes not yet invented at that time. He looked and saw them all, including you in white robes, with palm branches, singing, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might belong to the Lamb of God. Maybe you don't know this, but you are. Yes, you are in the Holy Scriptures. You were the sinners made saints by the blood of the Lamb of God and are part of the great multitude St. John is privileged to see in this apocalypse. This is your future, after all, foretold in God's word and seen by St. John. So it does not matter. It does not matter what happens to you here on earth, what anybody says about you, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be at work, whether the doctor has good news or bad news, what your enemies and persecutors do to you directly or behind your backs. What matters, what endures, is that the lamb who was slain lives. Jesus lives. And Jesus will bring you home. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the might. For yours is Jesus and nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God, not even death, which is yours in Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. So dear friends, come. Come, dear sinners, with me. Dear sinners made saints by the blood of the Lamb, Come and receive the foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of the Lamb's true body and blood. Gather around his holy throne with all the saints and the holy angels. For here, for here and now at this great feast of God, all heaven and earth come together as one. Your loved ones who have died in Christ, you can't see them, but they are here. They join in the great heavenly feast with you. You cannot see this reality in full yet. But the day is coming. The day is coming when your eyes will be fully open. For you are God's children already now. And what you will be has not yet appeared. But you know by faith that when Jesus appears, you shall be like him. For then you shall see Jesus as he is, and you are a part 
of that great multitude in St. John's vision. For you believe and trust in Jesus. Blessed are you then, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Dear saints on All Saints Day, yours is the kingdom of heaven now and forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And now may the peace of Almighty God, which surpasses all human comprehension, guard and protect your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.